listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for letting us share part of your day. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Meyer is in the supervisor seat next to me. Good morning, everyone. And we want to welcome everyone once again. Thanks to all of the people who have been with us all this time, all the new people who are joining us that, that seem to keep popping up all the time for some strange reason. You are interested in what we say. and We uh, love it. Yeah, we, we kind of <laughs> do because, well, let's face it. What we do, what we talk about here is not just about Bible stuff, but actually how to apply it to your life and, and what it means. And we're going to look at that today. Uh, I want to remind everybody, if you go to GiveGodNoney.com, there's all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, the couple of books are out, uh, Tradition to Truth, God's Universe, God's Rules, another one coming soon, I hope. Um, I figure I was hoping it would be out by now, but that's not a happening thing yet. If you like what you hear, remember the like buttons, the share buttons, hit the notifications. That helps everybody else find it as well because, you know, we don't advertise. You are our advertisement. So the more you do, the more people hear us. And that's how it works. I said something the other night um, about language. If you, Even though you're speaking the same... Yeah, yeah, it was Thursday night. Even if you're speaking the same language... If you're not defining words the same way, you're not communicating. And somebody, uh, I think it was either through Messenger or one of the other social media things, said, well, can you, you know, I, I'm not, I don't quite grasp what you're saying. You know, if you're speaking the same language and you say the same word, shouldn't you be able to understand what somebody's saying? <clears throat> and it's not quite like that. You know, in Australia, um, if you have a, like a little battery or car battery that no longer is able to function, it's called a flat battery because if you test it, it flatlines, right? But in the United States, it's a dead battery. But if you say a dead battery to an Australian, you're like, how can it be dead? It was never alive, right? Right. Now, think about music. Music in itself is an, a completely different language. Have you ever thought about, you know, we can read music, but we can't speak music? Did you ever think about that? You know the difference between a musician and an entertainer? A musician, a, an accomplished musician, is someone who can read music, uh, whatever instrument that they are applying that music to but they don't need the, the instrument you know a group of, of accomplished musicians can get together and they can look at the music and they can go uh, measure by measure and, and they go over it and when they pick up their instruments the first time it may not be perfect but it's very very close to exactly what is written an entertainer on the other hand often doesn't read music they you know they get the big money they get all the the fame and fortune sometimes <clears throat> but it's often very short-lived they don't have the long careers that a lot of accomplished musicians enjoy there's a big difference there if you can actually speak the, the well, i shouldn't say if you can actually read the language of music and then you can interpret that through your instrument that is how you then are able to come together and communicate in that language. So it's kind of like that. You know, if you, if you aren't communicating properly, um, then you can't, you don't really know what each other's saying. But if you're communicating properly, there's nothing you can't do. Just like when a group of musicians get together, they read the music, they apply that music through the instrument that they're that they're playing, and it 
it just becomes uh, most of the time, depending on your taste in music, enjoyable music, right? So that's how that works. But if you're not communicating properly, then, uh, well, you get chaos. It's that simple. I hope that helps understand. Um, some things we're going to look at today is, is quite interesting because I, I've often had people ask, you know, well, are they qualified to do that? And one of the things that we're going to look at today, Myra's going to read, uh, she's going to introduce us to some of the prophets. So go ahead and we're going to start with Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. These are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiahu. He belonged to the family of priests who lived in the town of An Anatote. The town is in the land that belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. This is the vision Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. God showed Isaiah what would happen to Judah and Jerusalem. Isaiah saw these things while Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, Ahaz and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. Joel 1.1 1, 1. The Lord spoke his words to Joel, son of Pituli. Hosea 1.1 1, 1 and 2 The Lord spoke his words to Hosea, son of Bari. This was during the time of Uzziah, Otam, Az Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. During part of this time, Jeroboam, Boam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. The Lord said to him, Go and marry a woman who will be unfaithful to you. She will give you children whose fathers are other men. Do this because people in this country have acted like an unfaithful wife toward the Lord. Amos 1.1 1, 1. Amos was one of the shepherds from the town of Tikota, T Tikoa. God showed him this version of about this vision about Israel. It was at the time Josiah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was king of Israel. This happens two years before the earthquake. <laughs> Aren't those names fun? All right. Now, this is just a few of the prophets that are in Scripture. Now, it isn't all of them by any means. But doesn't this group, uh, you know, it reads like a highly educated group of biblical scholars, doesn't it? I mean, you had farmers and shepherds. One uh, <laughs> was simply told to go and marry a prostitute. Now, I don't know. I, now I well, I should say it this: way. I do know a couple of denom Christian modern Christian denominations where that would automatically disqualify him uh, from being able to preach in their churches. Right. So. What qualifies these folks? This isn't everybody either. Now, remember in uh, 1 Kings 18, uh, when Jezebel had slaughtered the prophets of Jehovah, Obadiah had uh, taken a hundred prophets and hidden them. They're never named. So we don't know all of the prophets. We don't, we don't know who they all are. But what qualifies them to speak on behalf of our Creator? Isn't that an interesting topic, I thought? Um, what got me started on this was <laughs> uh, I was curious to find out what the requirements were for a Ph.D. in theology. All right? Not that I'm getting a Ph.D. in theology. It, it has no in I have no interest in that. But we know a lot of people who hold Ph.D.s in various fields. Some you know, hold PhDs in philosophy. Now, in philosophy, there are many different ways to approach philosophy. You know, there's a lot of different ways 
to consider how we think about things because that's basically what philosophy is, right? It's the, uh, the skill of being able to think. And unfortunately, in our world today, that is taking some skill. And it's a skill that's not taught to everyone properly. We know people who hold PhDs for other things. And likewise, there's a lot of ways, you know, I, I know a lot of people who have PhDs in agriculture, various fields of agriculture. And I know a lot of people who have PhDs uh, in agriculture who, you know, some are in plant sciences, some are in animal sciences. But the weird thing is there's a lot of different variations from school to school about these things because there are many ways to approach it. There's a lot of what, you know, when we think about agriculture, you know, you have plants, you have animals, but in the plant field, you have several uh, plant varieties that you could write a PhD thesis on. But there's a, always something about it that it takes you know, this whole concept uh, about, you know, this school teaches it this way, that school teaches it another way, even though you might be talking about the same thing, they're different because there's different ways to approach it. Here's the weird thing, though. How many, how many gods do we worship? Hopefully, one, right? There's only, you know, we have a lot of different manuscripts that make up the Bible, but they're all basically the same. So when I started looking at what it takes to think about having a PhD in theology, don't, do you think they would be all about the same? Shouldn't the schools all approach that from a similar position? If I was going to have a PhD in a field where there was only one book to study. If I was going to have a PhD in a field where there was only one person to write about, if I was going to have a PhD in a field where there was only a single purpose, do you think that every school who offered that PhD would have the same requirement? Well, if you thought that, you would be wrong. And, and it gets worse. I, I picked some of the more well-known schools when I looked at this. Uh, Princeton, Fuller, Villanova, and of course, you can't leave out Cambridge, right? You, you just can't leave out Cambridge. For Princeton, now the requirements to even get into the program are a bachelor's or a master of divinity. Now it says that right from their website, okay, all candidates must be fluent in English, must demonstrate uh, reading knowledge of two other modern languages, normally German and French. It is strongly recommended that candidates enter the program with a reading knowledge of both languages. Now, Let's think back for a moment. Bear with me as I, as I think back. The books that Moses wrote, were they written in German or French? I don't think so. W what about uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul? Were they written in German or French? I don't think so. If you're going to study a book that was originally written in Hebrew, why would you need German or French? Doesn't that sound a little odd? And in fact, isn't it easier if you take a language from its original and you translate it through several languages, are you going to get the same message? Well, I think we all know the answer to that, and it's no, you're not. Fuller doesn't even list their requirements, but they, they list uh, what they teach. The theological studies concentration students pursue research in one or more of the following disciplines, and they list Christian ethics, church history, historical theology, liturgical theology, practical theology. Well, wait a minute. 
what's all that have to do with, you know, saying that <laughs> there is one God, this is his, his sacred word, and by the way, you should live the way he designed you to live. By the way, one of the other things that that they require, one of the other options you have down there is systemic theology. What in the world is systemic theology? I didn't even bother to look it up because I really don't care. Villanova you know, has a list of requirements that are focused on language, but it doesn't specify what language. You know, they, they want you to speak two other languages, but they don't specify. Uh, liberty is, <laughs> you know, it says a Bible language competency is required for those applicants who plan to focus on biblical studies as their cognate field. Now, the academic requirements appear much more stringent for liberty than the others, but that's that's okay. In Cambridge, <laughs> you need a UK master's, a United uh, uh, Kingdom master's degree, or equivalent just to apply, and then you have to pass their language requirements, which, guess what, include German and French. Brings up a question in my mind, and it, I hope it brings up a question in yours. Why are there all these requirements today? There's only one creator. There's only one Bible. How is it possible for there to be so many different requirements from all of these different and various schools for a single source PhD? Well, the answer is simple. And I hope you're ready for this. They are not teaching Bible. They're teaching individual tradition. They're teaching individual doctrine. And it is absolutely ridiculous. Remember uh, how Elijah found Elisha? Elisha was plowing a field. Elijah is walking by and he looks and he sees Elijah and he says, come with me. And Elijah says, Okay. And what happened next? What was the test that Elisha was able to go? There was a test. Elisha was plowing. So they took the yoke off the oxen. They killed the oxen. They used the wood of the yoke to cook the oxen. There was no going back. It was impossible for him to return. So what qualifies someone? Myra's going to read something that I think will help us answer. Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. The Lord made me in the body of my mother, so I would be his servant. He made me to lead the people of Jacob back to him. He made me so that Israel might be gathered to him. The Lord will honor me. I will get my strength from my God. The Lord told me, you are an important servant to me. You will bring back the tribes of Jacob. You will bring back the people of Israel who are left alive. But more importantly, I will make you a light for all nations. You will show people all over the world the way to be saved. John fifteen sixteen, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will give you. So, who qualifies? Who ordains? Well, it's none, none of the schools that I mentioned. In fact, no, no person alive on earth has the qualifications to qualify anyone to speak for or in a representation of our Creator. Man does not have that authority. No amount of education, no amount of intelligence are able to give someone the skills they need to show others the glory of the Creator unless that skill was created in them as they were being knitted together in the womb. 
each one of us, each person alive today and who has lived, uh, is conceived through a very unique process of male and female unity. But we are created by the one who knits us together in the womb, who makes us exactly the way he wants us to be made and given the skills unique to each of us. Do you realize that Psalm 102.18 says that this shall be written for the generation to come and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Remember Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet. The Creator creates each one of us as individuals, giving each one of us the skills that, that we need to do the things He would like for us to do. We can say no, but He gives us the skills we need to accomplish the things that He would like for us to do. Now, some people might hear this and say, well, but there's children who are born with defects. There's people who are born imperfect. How in the world can you say that our Creator made them like that? He's a loving God. He, he's just, oh, He would never do anything like that. Let me say it this way. He puts them together exactly the way He needs them to be. Remember, when Yeshua was asked, Who sinned concerning a man born, born blind? You know, was it his parents? Did he sin? Yeshua said, neither. And Jesus said, nobody sinned. This man was born blind so that the glory of the Father could be known in his time. Myron, I know several parents or children who are considered to have defects. But of those families, the ones who are believers, regardless of denomination, regardless of status, regardless of anything else that, that might you might think would stand in their way, when they meet with the doctors, the nurses, or friends, they may not realize what they're doing. They may not realize what they're giving people, but they are displaying the glory of the Almighty in the way that they care for these children. You know, doctors may not always have some miraculous healing, right? They don't need to. It's the parents who, who are there who are speaking life into a situation where it seems like death they're speaking light into a place of darkness. You know, there, there's a young person we know who's the youngest of all the siblings. And there's some serious medical issues there. But this young person is the happiest of all of her older siblings. You know, it, it's just that simple. There were people that I knew growing up who were, well, we, when we called them back then, were mentally unstable. Okay, uh, Their parents were. The family was barely able to get by. But looking back, I see now that had it not been for the hand of the Creator in their lives, they would have suffered terribly. You know, it wasn't easy for them. But they would have suffered terribly. Look around. Who do you know? Do you see people who seem to be out of touch or maybe even physically challenged? What is it that keeps them from self-destruction? Now think about some of the people you know who seem to be healthy. Some may be successful. Some might be rich. Right? How many of them seem to self-destruct in some way or another? I had a, a gentleman that worked for me many years ago. Now by all appearances, he was successful. He was productive. He did a good job. But he had actually rejected his creator. He was living, he was not living a, a lifestyle that he should have been living. He actually wound up murdering his wife and then he committed suicide. It was a very, very, very sad situation all the way around. He had a terrible, terrible life all because of one choice that he had made you know everybody thought he was well adjusted but his life of denial his life of rejection for the creator you know he was not 
glorifying the Almighty. Instead, he was actively in opposition to the Almighty. Given every chance to repent, he chose darkness at every turn. He chose death at every choice he made. Yet, the world would look at his life and say, well, he's perfectly normal. He's well adapted. But no amount, no amount of what the world says is able to, to offer anything that the Almighty can offer. No amount of trial, no amount of tribulation that the world gives you can prepare you for the death and destruction that is in the world. But, do you know who qualifies the qualified? Our Creator does. There's no amount of education. There's no amount of education that can qualify you, not from people. You were either born with it, and we'll get to more of that in a second, or you acquire it through desire. Our Creator doesn't look at your ability. He doesn't look at your disability. They, those things really don't concern Him. Because everyone has the opportunity. Some have been chosen uh, to teach the teachers. Some have been chosen to be students. Some have been chosen to be examples for the others around them to, to look at that situation, look how they react to certain things and say, well, there is an example that I need to follow. If you think you're not qualified because you don't have some uh, letters behind your name, you, you haven't been to a school to teach you how to teach people, how to stand in front of a group of people and talk about the Almighty, you're in good company because none of the prophets you were introduced to earlier had any of that training either. They all learned it. Some of them learned it as they went along, right? And some were actually children of priests, but don't confuse priests with prophets. Not every priest was a prophet. Not every prophet was a priest. You know, <laughs> if you think that you're not qualified, think again. Moses, Elijah, Paul, <laughs> and here I'm, I'm going to upset some Christian folks now because even Jesus, even Yeshua himself, would not be qualified to preach in any of our modern Christian churches because they haven't been to seminary, right? They haven't been to school. They haven't been to Bible college. They simply wrote the book. Here's something that will and, and, and I know somebody like this. And he may be, I don't think he's listening today, but he, he may hear this anyway. You may be qualified and not even know it. One of our, our favorite folks, Jay, uh, the first time he showed up at a Messianic Delaware, uh, and, and it was the first time that he showed up and, and he was kind of trying to figure out everything and how everything was going. And somebody looked at him and said, Jay, before long you will be teaching. He kind of blew it all. And it was about, what, six months later? He was teaching. Yep. You may be qualified and not even know it. But everything begins with one simple concept. And that is choosing to live the lifestyle that your creator designed you to live. And if you visit givegodmoney.com, you can achieve that lifestyle. It doesn't cost you any money. If you go there and you begin to improve your life, doing the small things that you can do every day, just little little bitty changes every day, it's very, very easy to change your lifestyle. And it's all it takes to start. 
That's all it takes. Now, check us out. See what's there. If you go through the process, if you really do benefit from that process, then you can help others by supporting us to pass it along just like somebody passed it along to you. It's free to you because somebody else paid for it. And that you can help pass along. But it all starts with one choice. It all starts with one uh, opportunity to say, I need to change the way I live. I need to do something different. I need to improve my life. And the best way to improve that is to live or learn to live the way my creator designed me to live. So with that, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Thanks for joining us today. See you on Thursday. <laughs> yes, we will. We will be back Thursday for more. Until then, many, many blessings, everyone.